am Dr. Caitlin Hargrave. I am the Spiritual Life Coordinator for the Center for Student Life. I work with Campus Ministry and I am a breast cancer survivor. Um, so I was diagnosed with HER2 positive invasive ductal carcinoma, which is just a type of breast cancer, um, in early March of 2020. Um, I found a lump one day when I was in the shower, and that was toward the end of January. I um, went to my doctor within about a week of noticing that, and um, they're like, all right, let's give it like two weeks to see if it goes away. Sometimes that just happens. Um, and then it didn't go away. So we did a um, ultrasound. They didn't like how it looked on the ultrasound. They did a biopsy. Um, and then that was when uh, a week after the biopsy, I got a call from my doctor to come into the office, which of course was nerve wracking. And um, she just quickly jumped to the point. Um, my husband Clay came with me and we were sitting there and as soon as she walked in, she sat down and she looked at me and she said, I'm sorry to tell you that you have breast cancer. And, um, you know, I felt like my heart just dropped and I had this immediate like awful pit in my stomach and um, it was, you know, completely unexpected. Um, I don't have any family history of breast cancer or anything and so it wasn't something that I was thinking would ever happen to me. Um, and, you know, you're, I was obviously in shock and so, um, <laughs> one of the things that I was like fixated on in that moment was making sure that I paid my copay. <laughs> and she's like, you don't need to worry about that right now. Like you can do that later. Um, and so she was kind of laughing at me, like that's what I was choosing to focus on in that moment because I was just so overwhelmed by the diagnosis, which is kind of a funny story now. But um, at the time it was just giving me something else to focus on because it was such an awful um, thing. And so once we got to the car, um, Clay and I both just like totally broke down and called my parents and called his parents. Um, yeah, I was really awful. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how else to describe it really. Um, one of the first things was calling family and friends and just making sure that we had the support that we needed to get through it. Um, my diagnosis came just a few weeks before the state shut down for the pandemic. And so I actually met with my surgeon a couple days before the state shut down. And so we didn't know that that was gonna happen obviously, but we were really glad to have, you know, touched base with family and friends prior to all of that happening so that we could, um, you know, have support <laughs> throughout all of that and find ways to, to receive that. Um, but then it was very much like, okay, I got the diagnosis. Now let's get the appointments with the surgeon so we can make a plan of like what my treatment plan is going to look like, when surgery is going to happen, what type of treatments do I need? How long is this going to go? Um, and so I worked all of that out with my doctor, um, with my surgeon. And then, um, about, I had to wait about a month after that to actually start treatment. So I met in mid-March with my surgeon, got my treatment plan, and then started treatment in April. Um, so I had a few options for treatment. Um, the one that I went with was the one that my doctor most di uh, recommended um, for my diagnosis. I don't really know how to describe it without getting too technical. It's like either do surgery first and then the treatments or do treatments and then surgery and then more treatment. And that was the route that I took. Um, so in April of 2020, I started chemotherapy and targeted therapy and I went every three weeks. So I would have um, one week where I felt completely awful, like stuck on the couch, nauseous. I was having to give myself um, a shot in my thigh every day for five days after chemotherapy um, in order to help boost my white blood cell count. Um, and so I would have treatment, have to get myself shot for five days, and then I would have two weeks of feeling pretty good. So I never was like puking or anything from nausea, but I was like super nauseous all the time during that one week. And then I would have two weeks of feeling good. So I would like always make a point to take walks with my dog and do things like that when 
um, I was feeling good getting my body moving and trying to have some sense of normalcy during those two weeks um, because I knew that in another week or two I would have another week where I felt completely awful um, so after my first treatment um, I within just like a week or two started to lose my hair a little bit and so um, prior to my second chemo treatment we shaved my head um, and that was a really emotional experience um, you know I I've always been somebody that's like it's just hair do whatever you want with like it's super fun whatever and so there was a part of me that was just like all right cool like this is just part of it let's do it I'm gonna embrace this phase and then you know my hair will grow back and it did um, but it was my husband Clay shaved my head and I actually have a video of it somewhere I didn't ever post it on social media or anything because I'm like sobbing <laughs> and Clay's making all these like jokes and stuff to try to make me laugh throughout it which was really sweet but um, that was I think the moment for me that I realized that this was something that was going to be more than just like a one-time um, thing as far as like you know I'm not just going to chemo once <laughs> this is something I'm gonna have to do for several months I did that through August of 2020. I had about a month of a break and then I had surgery in September. And so then um, my surgery happened um, and within about a few days, I don't remember the exact time frame, but um, we got a call from my doctor that I had a complete pathological response to the chemo, which just means that they didn't find any cancer in my body, which was like amazing to hear. Um, I, my cancer diagnosis was stage 1B, so there are three stages with each stage of cancer, so like 1A, 1B, 1C, so mine was 1B, um, <clears throat> which is early, like that's, that's great. Um, and so they expected that that would be the, the response to the treatment, but um, it was of course great to hear that that was actually what happened. So September 4th, 25th is my like um, cancer-free anniversary. And so I always try to be reflective on that day and um, just kind of think back over the last several years and where I was, where I am now, things like that. Um, and then in November, I did radiation five days a week for a whole month. Um, so I had to drive into my doctor's office, literally be in radiation treatment for like five to 10 minutes and then drive back. Um, but all throughout that, I was still going every three weeks for my targeted therapy. Um, and so that was something that I didn't complete until April of 2021. So um, once we got to April of 2021 and I finished my targeted therapy, um, I had a port placed um, for all of my IV treatments to go through. So I was a month after my targeted therapy was over, I was able to get my port removed. So I've got a nice big old scar right here for where my, uh, my port was. Um, but then uh, I also then started after radiation, started taking a daily medication um, that I ha am still on and I will continue to be on that for two more years. So I'll have five years total of um, a daily medication. Um, and then I also, throughout this whole process, so since April of 2020, have had a monthly injection in my stomach um, to keep my ovaries asleep because my cancer was estrogen fed. And so um, I'm in medical menopause, which is another like crazy part of all of this. And so um, that will continue for two more years as well. So I will be completely done with all forms of treatment in December of 2025. Yeah, so support for my experience was really different than what it would have been if it hadn't happened during COVID. <laughs> um, because I literally started treatment within weeks of the pandemic really shutting everything down. I wasn't able to bring anyone with me to any of my treatments. I had to drive myself to my port placement and drive myself home from that, um, which was like a minor surgery. Um, I drove myself to and from all of my chemotherapy appointments. The only time that Clay went with me was when we initially met with my surgeon before the pandemic hit. And then he was at the hospital when I had my um, lumpectomy. 
but everything else I did on my own because nobody was allowed in the spaces that I was in for all of my treatments um, because you know the people that are going through cancer treatment are immunocompromised and so we had to be extremely careful because of COVID and so because all of that um, we didn't see my family for months Um, I'm a very optimistic person in general. I like have often said that I'm an eternal optimist and sometimes to a fault, like I can get so caught up in trying to be positive that I am not present in the moments even when they're really hard because I'm trying to just look at the good. Um, and so that can be both a positive and a negative um, depending on the situation. Um, but one of the, or a few of the ways that I was able to stay positive and to kind of hold on to hope was just that like I was really intentional with how I was trying to process everything like I was trying to stay as present as I could and acknowledge both the good and the hard um, in the midst of everything and part of <clears throat> the way that I was able to do that was I started my doctorate which sounds crazy <laughs> um, but I got my doctorate of ministry I started it in May of 2020 so right as I was starting treatment and everything um, and it gave me something to focus on. And so I wasn't just sitting at home kind of wallowing in like the awful, <laughs> but was um, giving me tools for intentional reflection because it was a spiritual formation degree. I was given a lot of these tools to say like, okay, how do we see God in the midst of difficulty? How do we reflect well? Um, and so not only did that give me tools for my own reflection but then it gave me something to focus on that wasn't you know all of the treatment and how terrible I felt and all of that um, so that was super helpful and um, also just like being intentional with the weeks that I did feel well um, again going for walks with the dog or going um, and just sitting outside on the days where I felt well enough to be up off the couch I spent a lot of time on the deck outside at our house um, reading for school, even working, because I worked from home throughout all of this. And so like on the days when it was nice outside, I would sit on my deck and do my work instead of sitting inside. Um, and just trying to be intentional with like what I was able to do and where I was doing it so that I wasn't just cooped up inside on my own um, all the time. And so, and on my own, I mean like, you know, being outside in nature um, felt a little less lonely than being in the house. So um, I think intentional reflection, focusing on school, and spending time outside with my dogs and with Clay. Learning that I was cancer-free was kind of a two-fold thing. Um, my doctor actually said that I can never say that I'm actually in remission um, because my cancer is estrogen fed and so because estrogen will always be in my body um, I will always be at some sort of risk for recurrence however the way that they phrased it was that I am the most cancer free that I will ever be which is that I don't have cancer in my body right now and there's always like a little chance that it could be back anytime which is obviously terrifying um, so hearing that I, they don't recommend that I say that I'm cancer free that way, um, was kind of disappointing after going through so many things and knowing that I am as cancer free as I will ever be right now, you know, right in that moment when they told me was also really exciting and freeing and, um, you know, it, it felt very surreal. One of the things that I was wanting to complete as I was going through all of that, right, I started my doctorate, and so I graduated with my doctorate um, in May of this year, so that was super exciting. Um, but, so that was like the big thing that I had been focused on recently. Um, but now I'm just trying to like find things that bring me joy and trying to continue to appreciate the small moments of life um, that are good um, and paying attention to both the big and the small good things because um, you know practices of gratitude and paying attention to the good in the midst of the hard were a lot of what got me through all of that 
treatment and the, all of the hard things that happened. Um, and so I'm trying really hard to not let go of those practices, but to continue them now. Um, and so that's not necessarily like a big, you know, goal that I'm like going toward, but it's still something that I'm trying to do. Um, but yeah, just trying to like find fun things to do. Like I'm done with school. I'm done with all of the really hard parts of treatment. Um, and so what can I do to fill my time that is life giving, um, that helps me embrace more of who I am and what I'm capable of. Um, and so like right now I'm in a theater production with a local community theater, which I haven't done anything like that for like 10 or so years. Um, and so just trying to find things that I enjoy doing and try new things and, you know, um, just live life. Like it feels really stereotypical to say like, you know, embrace life, you know, but as a result of cancer or whatever. Um, but it's true, like it, it does kind of make you realize that there, that life is precious and beautiful and that there's so much to enjoy. And so I'm trying to find things that bring me joy and do those things now that I have more space to do that.